In this lesson, we're going to look at how we can solve equations that involve trigonometric functions. And this is super, super important for going on to next year for calculus. So, or next semester for you lucky folks who are taking it in high school. Okay. So the thing about trig equations that's different than any other kind of equation is that we actually, every solution we get for a theta, if we're trying to find cosine, like if we know that cosine theta equals one, for example, we know that let's, let's just take that super simple equation. So cosine theta equals one. Well, if we think about this as, if we think about the graph, y equals cosine theta, Okay, so we know that cosine theta equals one at zero, and then we go down, and then we go down here, 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 but then we know that it equals one again at two pi. And because this is a periodic function, we know that, in fact, if we actually keep our x-axis going, that we're gonna have our next few points, and that we're gonna hit one again at four pi. So actually what's going to happen is our solution is going to be repeating every two pi. So this can be a bit challenging when we're trying to figure out what our solution actually is. Okay, so generally, when you take an inverse trig function and you get a solution, your solution is going to repeat once. It might even repeat twice. So let's say instead of cosine theta equals one, we were looking at cosine theta equals one half. So that would be right here. So we would actually have two solutions between zero and two pi, and then there would be two solutions between zero and four pi. So we're gonna have these solutions that repeat. So one of the things we have to notice is that this solution and this solution are exactly two pi apart, and this solution and this solution are exactly two pi apart. So there is a pattern to when the solutions occur, and if you have one solution, there's going to be paired solutions that will occur every two pi as long as there's no horizontal expansion or compression. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. Okay. Um, so there's two different types of solutions we can get for tr trigonometric equations. We can get a conditional solution and the conditional solutions are within bounds. Okay. So we have some and the way that we know that we have a, a conditional solution is that we'll have something like x has to be between 0 and 2 pi. And that's what you had last unit when you were trying to work out what angle gave you a certain value of a trig function. We might have like t between 0 and 2. You did that in some, some different kinds of word, word problems where we limited what your possible solutions were. We didn't make you generalize the solution. Okay. So your general form solution is going to be all possible solutions. And that can be a lot. So generally for each of your individual solutions, so you can see between zero and two pi, we had two solution. So your new solution, your, your kind of generalized solution for that, each of those single solution is going to be your solution, okay? Plus something times K where K is an integer, okay? Usually this is gonna be two pi but it's not always gonna be two pi. And we'll talk about when it's not. That's usually when you have something like cosine of two theta equals something. So that's how we're gonna put our solution. So let's look at a relatively simple linear equation with a trig function, and we'll see how that goes, okay? So a linear equation, we might take two sine x minus one, equals zero. And we're going to try to solve that equation. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to add one 
to both sides. So we get two, you're going to solve it just like you would any other linear equation. So linear equation, you try to get all the numbers on one side, all the variables on the other side. So we're going to do that. We get two sine x equals one. And now we're going to divide because again, this is a linear equation. So what we're doing is we're solving for what sine x is. We're not going to worry about dealing with the sine. We're just pretending sine x is like a number. Okay. So we get sine x equals one half. So now what we need to do is we need to figure out what angles of x have a sine of one half. So we're going to look at our here. We know one half. This is our, um, what is it? It's our opposite side. Okay. Or our y. And this is our, our hypotenuse or our radius. Okay, it's positive, so we know sine is positive in quadrant one and two. We know our opposite is one, and we know our hypotenuse is two, and that makes this a 30, 60, 90, or a pi over six, pi over three, pi over two, right triangle. And the one that's in here, one is the shorter side, so this is gonna be the smaller angle, so that's gonna be pi over six, okay? So my values of x, and this is going to have also a reference angle of pi over 6, but we want to measure the theta in quadrant 2. So our x is going to be pi over 6. That is our quadrant 1 solution. And 5 pi over 6. If we're looking just in our quadrant 1, quadrant 2, quadrant 3, and quadrant 4. So this right here is what we call our conditional solution. It's the one that's between zero and two pi. So now we wanna generalize this, okay. And what we're gonna do is we're going to take each one of our zero to two pi solutions and we're going to do, um, we're going to add two pi k to it. So we're going to do pi over six plus two pi k and we're gonna do five pi over six plus two pi k. So those are gonna be our generalized solutions, okay? Um, and you notice we take each one of those because each one of those is gonna be at a slightly different position on our trig graph. Okay, so what would it be like if we had a similar linear equation, but instead of sine x equals one half, Okay, what if instead of sine x equals one half, we had something like sine three x equals one half? Okay, so what we can do is we can come up with our different solutions here. So we know, we don't necessarily know what x is gonna be. We know that three x though is gonna be the same as our conditional solutions up here. So three x is gonna be pi over six and five pi over six. So the thing is, if we're looking for a conditional solution, let's look for between zero and two pi. This isn't gonna give us all the possible solutions between zero and two pi, because I notice when I divide by six, I'm gonna get pi over 18 and five pi over 18. So probably if I have some bigger solutions, that will also be the case. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go around, if you look up here, I'm going around my circle, another 2 pi, which gives me 7 pi over 6. Okay. And this number right here is going to tell you this times as many solutions, because this is your horizontal compression factor. So you're compressing it. So your period would be, instead of being two pi, it's going to be two pi over three. So you're going to go through one rotation every two pi over three. And that means you will have gone through three full cycles by the time you get to two pi. And three full cycles means six solutions. And we actually have to give six solutions. Okay. So this is round one. We're going to have to do round two and round three, because my number is three. So I have seven pi over six, and the next one is going to be nine, not nine pi over six, it's going to be plus four pi over six is 11 pi over six. 11 pi, nope, still wrong. Gosh, Miss Eden, why can't we do this? 11 pi over six is before. This is gonna be 13 pi over six, and then we're gonna add four pi over six, and this is going to be 17 pi over six. Then we're going to go another loop around the circle. So four pi 
is 24 pi over 6. So this is going to be 25 pi over 6. And then we go 4 pi more, and this is going to be 29 pi over 6. Okay, so now these are all my values for 3x. So my conditional solution x is going to be pi over 18. 5, I'm just dividing everything by 3. 5 pi over 18. 13 pi over 18. 17 pi over 18. 25 pi over 18 and 29 pi over 18. And so this will give me all my solutions where 3x is going to be one of those actual solutions. So sine of 3x is going to be, 3 times that is going to equal 1 half. And those are my possibilities. And these are all between 0 and 2 pi. Okay, and we can see 29 pi over 18, 36 pi over 18 would be 2 pi. So we know that that's between 0 and 2 pi as well. Okay, and so if I wanted to give the general solution, it would be every one of these six solutions plus 2 pi k, because these are all unique solutions and they're all going to repeat repeatedly. So there's, as you can see, sine 3x equals 1 half, there's actually a lot of possibilities for what x could be. And you can go through and you can actually try sine of 3 times each of these solutions and see that it works. And then if you add 2 pi to any of these solutions, it will also work. Okay, so those are linear equations of a variety that come out. What if we have a quadratic equation? Okay. So quadratic equations, again, so the first, with quadratic equations, we're going to do two kind of examples. So the first, like with the linear equation, the first one was just how do we do a basic one using trig? And the next one is how does trig potentially make this a little bit more complicated? So let's say we have a quadratic equation that says sine x equals 2 sine squared of x. Um, actually, we just use sines. Let's do cosines just for fun. My notes say sine, but you know what? I'm going to go off book here. Let's go cosine x equals 2 cosine squared of x. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is divide by cosine of x, right? Right? Wrong! We never divide by a what? We never divide by a variable. Why? And the reason that we never divide by a variable, it's the same reason why we have x equals x squared. So let's take a look at our, our little, um, the sad tale of the PC12 student who divided, divided by x. Nice little story for you here. So the sad tale of the pre-calculus 12 student who divided by a variable. We had a lovely little equation, x squared equals x. So my pre-calculus 12 student divided by x, and then he got x equals 1. And this was on a test. And so he said, yes, and then I go back and check my answer, and 1 works. This is amazing. And so what happened was, this was a one mark question, and he got minus one half mark. Why did he get minus one half mark? Oh, that's so sad. Because x squared minus x, if x squared minus x equals zero, this equation can be solved by factoring. So we actually get two solutions. We get x equals zero and x equals one. Those are two possible solutions. So what happens is when we divide by a variable by a variable we lose the zero solution. 
So even though it looks like dividing would be the right thing to do, when you're solving an equation, you don't divide by variables because variables can have any value. The only time you could divide by x squared plus one because that's never gonna be zero, but you can't divide by anything that has even the slightest, most remote chance of being zero because you might lose a zero solution. So in this case, what we are gonna do, hopefully all of you enjoyed that very, very sad tale, is we are going to get everything on one side. So let's make this zero equals two cosine squared of x. You solve quadratic equations just like quadratics, which is get everything on one side. Minus cosine x equals zero. And then you factor. So we have a common factor of cosine x. This is equal to cosine x times two cosine x minus one. Okay, remember when you take everything away, you're left with a one when you're factoring. Okay, if this is complicated, you can always replace cosine x equals like a, and then try factoring zero equals two a squared minus a, and then solve that equation and then just replace it with cosine x. That's always an option. And we're gonna see how that might work in a later problem. Okay, so now we have two possibilities. We have cosine x equals zero and two cosine x minus one equals zero. So for cosine x equals zero, there's only one place between zero and two pi that that happens and that is x equals, sorry, there's two places that that happens. That's x equals pi over two and three pi over two between zero and two pi. That's my conditional solution. Okay, so we, jet, we always find the conditional solutions between zero and two pi first so that we can then add and find the rest of our general solutions. Here we have co two cosine x equals one, so cosine x equals one half. And there are also two places between zero and two pi. This happens if you need to sketch your triangles, cosine x equals one half here, one, two, and here in quadrant one and four, 30, 60, 90 right triangle. This one is our pi over three angle. So our x is equal to pi over three and five pi over three. Okay, so these are my four solutions. So then I could write my four general, my general solution actually has four parts. I'll write the general solution for this one. I'm not gonna do it for the next one. I leave it as an exercise for you. So my general solution is pi over two. I notice here, this is a little shortcut you can take. I notice pi over two and three pi over two are exactly pi apart. And then three pi over two to five pi over two is another pi apart. So I'm just gonna generalize these two solutions. This is a trick you can, you, I'm not gonna take off marks if you do pi over two plus two pi k and three pi over two plus two pi k. But this one I can simplify to pi over two plus pi k because the spacing between the solutions is equal, okay? Here the spacing is not equal. It's much further going around to quadrant four than it is between quadrant four and quadrant one. So here I need to write separate solutions. So pi over three plus two pi k and five pi over three plus two pi k. Um, so now, how does trig make this more complicated? Well, sometimes you could have a mixed quadratic that doesn't fully factor, where, where it doesn't fully factor away. So let's say we have sine x times cos x equals cosine squared x. So we've got a sine to cosine and I can't necessarily get rid of that. So what I'm going to do is I am going to just try to solve it like a quadratic. So I'm gonna get everything on one side, zero equals cosine squared x minus sine x cos x. Okay, so we now have zero equals, I can factor out a common factor of cosine x, zero equals cosine x times cosine x minus sine x, okay? So here is a place where sometimes tangent can be useful. So I have two solutions now, cosine x equals zero and cosine x minus sine x equals zero. So I'm gonna rearrange those. I get cosine x equals sine x. So now what I'm gonna do, strangely, is I'm gonna divide both sides by cosine x, okay? Because I can tell here if 
one of these is zero, we're gonna have a problem. So we have cosine x equals sine x. And we actually don't have the problem that they're both gonna be zero, so that's pretty cool. So divide both sides by cosine x and I get one equals tan x. So we know that tan x has to be one. And because this is a linear equation, we don't need to worry so much about losing a zero solution here. So we have one equals tan x. So that's only the place where sine equals cosine, and that only happens at one place. So you can do tan inverse of one. Either way, you're gonna get x equals pi over four, and you're gonna get five pi over four because that happens down in quadrant, tan is positive in quadrant one, and then same reference angle in quadrant four. Cosine x equals zero, and if you need to, when you have one equals tan x, you can use a special triangle or tan inverse. The problem with using tan inverse is that it will give you a decimal approximation. So I'll be able to know that you didn't know that special triangle there. And exact answers are preferable. Cosine x equals zero. Well, that again happens at two places in our coordinate plane, pi over two and three pi over two is where cosine x equals zero. Okay. So if we go here, now we've got all of these, and if you want to do the general solution, I leave it up to you. Okay.